on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power. Ready for your next big move? The trip from the fridge to the couch. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie Now then, you're very welcome back. So I have to say, really excited to chat to our next guest about his incredibly interesting career. He made his debut for Bristol Rovers age 17. He had a long playing career, largely in the old third and second divisions. Finished up at Bournemouth in 1992. His first managerial gig was at Bournemouth and then there were four good years at Gillingham and really his second stint at Stoke was incredible and it's how we all know him, I suppose, in the main. We're talking uh, seven years, 06 to 2013. Took them from Championship to Premier League mainstays, reached an FA Cup final, made the Europa League last 32, played at the Mestalla against Valencia there. Uh, subsequently managed Crystal Palace, kept them up, Premier League manager of the season in 2014. Thank you very much and uh, more recently short spell at Sheffield Wednesday which ended in uh, December I am of course talking about Tony Pulis Tony you're very welcome great to have you on thank you Joe I know you're not a tech madman and not a big man on social media so you've sorted out uh, Zoom or Skype or whatever you're on there anyway no, Deb's just done that for me <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we wouldn't be talking otherwise Joe <laughs> listen loads to talk to you about I want to kick things off with you in action if I can I found a clip I was doing some research so um, this will bring you back now if there's any uh, kids listening to the radio or sensitive ears then just uh, turn off for the next two minutes and then come back to us there won't be any other uh, bad language but I thought I'd uh, kick us off with Tony Pulis in action this is Gillingham 1998 against Wrexham you're going to hear some uh, pre-match talk and then a bit of oh, half-time no. advice as well <laughs> from... Uh, 1998? 1998. What age were you then? Yeah, I don't know. Too far back. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, you'd, you'd stop playing in 92. Years back, Joe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here he is. This is, uh, this is Gillingham getting ready to go out and play uh, Wrexham, and here's Tony Pulis in action. Body, a good start. First then, a first tackle, first pass. Make it a fucking good one, lads, and then you start yourself off then. And your fucking first tackle. Let's not fucking forget that. Fucking look forward to it. Fucking get out there, fucking roll your sleeves up and start fucking working. Right from the first fucking whistle. Any fucking tackle, blue shirts. And then when we get it, fucking pass it. Don't pass back, don't pass square when you can fucking go on and do something with it. Gals, any space, run it in. Run it in, S. Don't get turning out, run it in. Run it into space. Nicky, same with you, mate. If you get past the Nick, run it all the way. But get all of it. More than fucking two touches, Steve. More than two touches. Come on, as we lose it, shake. S, give him a shout all the time. Hey, as soon as we lose it, shake. Shake all the time. Fucking shake all the time. They're going to score against us if they're going to do anything against us, lads. Let's fucking make them work for it. It's going to be a fucking good goal if they score it. Not one that we give them. Make them play fucking back. Make them play fucking square. Get your shape all the time, then. Fucking off it in my positions at times. We're just fucking off it a little bit. Gals, the eight's fucking taking the piss at times, mate. I'm going to have to pull back the <laughs> hey? Yeah, well, we settle the cross then. <laughs> okay, no problem. So, where's Stevie Butler? Steve, you pick the four, uh, the, the 11 who's sitting out. You pick him out, we shuffle across, across quicker. Right? As soon as it happens, where's Smudger? You don't pick fucking eight up, because what's happening is he's gone out to the fullback and the eight's fucking tucking in. For the last fucking couple of minutes, there's a throw in and you're in a fucking flame as well as that. And you fucking, he's not marking no one. They're throwing it over his head into the last fucking feet. Get the f there. So he can't fucking throw it then. And that's what we've been like. We've been loose. We're fucking loose. Little parts are loose. Ass, smudge, fucking magnificent in there. Keep it fucking going. Well done, Ad. But you've got to work the fault. The right back is getting out all the time. And like the fucking two, one of you's got to get out to him. Otherwise, he's their spare man all the fucking time. He's the fucking spare man all the time. It's there if you want it. You've got to keep your shape and keep fucking tight. Keep your shape and don't take fucking chances at the back because they're nice and bright. Oh, Tony, now we're talking, huh? <laughs> I, <laughs> I deny everything that's just been played. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! How uh, how different was Tony Pulis in 1998 in the dressing room like that versus say 2013, 2014? Oh, completely. The, the you know the world spun round, the world's changed. 
I think then, you know, men were men. Um, and there was an, an, an acceptability, I think, as a player, um, uh, as a coach and as a manager that, um, you know, you could take you could take a little bit of stick, you could take responsibility, um, and you could take the fact that people would call you out. Um, and that was all part and parcel of early management, really. Mm. Um, but it changes, you know, that society changes. And if you don't change with it, Joe, you know, then you don't last you know, as long as maybe you could last. Mm. So the voice mightn't have been as loud, the language might have been a bit different, more one-on-one -on -one stuff. What would you have been like in, say, 13, 14? No, I'd still be, I'd still, a lot of the things that I'm saying there, still a lot of the things, you know, but if we could play forward, play forward. I was always a, uh, an advocate of, you know, I was brought up at a young age um, and it was always implanted, that, you know, being a more of a defensive player. Defend or defender or uh, a mid old in midfield player, that the best players on the pitch were the forwards and the wide players. And the, the basics when I was at Bristol was to get the ball to them as quickly as you possibly could and allow them to play. Mm. You know, they were the best, they were, they were, you know, the cream on the cake. And like I say, the more you could get the ball to them, the more you could do it with them being in the final third. You know, the more goals you'd score, the more opportunities you create, and more you know, more chances you had of winning football matches. So, you know, it was, um, yeah, you know, it, it, you know, I apologise for the language. Not at all. Um, Not I at hope all. my children don't hear me saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, that, that you know, like I say, that that I think that was accepted then very much. Yeah. Um, I don't think it would be today. Interesting. I uh, look. Stop with the apologies. We all use that kind of language. I mean, that's the way it was done. I thought it was very interesting <laughs> at half time. Half time chat. It wasn't simply a case of you're not trying. I need more effort. It was very specific tactical advice. You know, their right back is free. You have to tuck in. You have to get out and stop him. There was some very definite information there. It wasn't just blood and thunder either. So. Obviously, you saw the game very well at that age, and you worked very hard as a player even ahead of time on your coaching badges and got them young and were going down to Lillishall and watching the likes of Bobby Robson or Terry Venables or foreign coaches putting on you know, week-long seminars. So you knew yes. pretty early on coaching could well be for me. I want to be in this game. Joe, I'd left, I'd left South Wales. I left a family of, um, of eight um, living down at Docks in South Wales, and, and I promised myself... You know the opportunity of playing for professional football would be a once in a lifetime chance, and I promised myself I'd give it everything, um, and I'd do everything I could not to go back to South Wales, not in a in a in a bad mad way, mm. but just to prove that um, you know, or or to achieve um, what was my dream. And my dream was always to be a professional footballer, to be involved in football, um, and I was very very fortunate to go to a very very good club, Bristol Rovers, for for young players. You know, we had some um, magnificent people there who, um, you know, who, who, who set standards. The standards they set were, were fantastic. They were great mentors. Mm. You know, the old bit of Bob Campbell, Bill Dodging. Um, you know, Don Mason was my first manager. Uh, you know, Colin Dobson. Yeah, I go through them. Gordon yeah. Bennett, Joe Davis, and there was great senior pros there as well. Some fantastic senior professionals who helped you along the way and like I say um, yeah. it was a good club to go to the, the reason really that I got involved in coaching so early was that at 21 I think of 2021 20, first game of the season we played in what is now the championship at Cambridge and I broke um, or I broke I bust um, one of my main ligaments in my leg um, and it snapped at the bottom in my ankle I had an operation on my ankle I was out for, for almost a year well it was a season full season Mm. And during that time, um, you know, I was encouraged by the football club. This is how good the football club were to young people and young players. They encouraged me to um, to take my coaching badges. They encouraged me to 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 have another life. If you know, uh, God forgive the you know the injury would curtail my playing career. Mm. And it just set me off to it. Just you know, it just made me you know. Dave Burnside was the um, you know the the county coach for Gloucester, who was a wonderful man, and Dave helped me in in loads of ways to to take my prelim, my intermediate badge, and then I went on and took my full badge, and passed all of them by the time I was 21 years of age. Wow! And that gave me the opportunity, Joe. Then, as you've said, to go to Lillishaw as a as a young um, player, 
at times, you know, you know being around the, the top coaches in the country, top some top coaches in the world who, who came and put sessions on. But Lily Shaw, the, the week at Lily Shaw was, was absolutely, well, every, every year, you know, I put my name down to it before the season started. It was so interesting mm. um, and, and a great place to learn. And, you know, you, you, you listen to, you know, you're lucky enough to be in company of, you know, top, top people. Who, you know, you talk about um, listening and, and learning and all the stuff that, you know, that you heard me talking about, it would have been gained over a period of time. And, you know, one of the great things I learned from a very, very early age was to understand what you had in respect of quality um, and getting the best out of that, whichever way, shape or form. Mm. If you don't win football matches, you don't stay in football very long. And what you have to do, and what I was taught very, very early, was to assess the quality that you had and and use that um to the best of their ability to get results that you need yes and i've always done that I've, you know i've never ever moved away from that i've always looked and tried to find a way of winning with the teams i've been with you um talked there about your chance to go off and be a professional footballer almost as the winning lottery ticket this is your chance to really make a brilliant life for yourself your upbringing you mentioned in Newport South Wales this is real kind of mining town steel industry I think your father was involved in the steel industry yes I was reading your yeah. upbringing what three bed terrace uh, six kids two parents eight in the house um, that's crammed in <laughs> Joe listen we had nothing but we had everything mm. um, I wouldn't change my upbringing for anything I was brought up in a very very uh, well it, it, down the docks you know, with the steel works, we had the docks, we had the, the, the uh, railway tracks running through the, the area that we lived in, bringing the coal down from the, from the valleys to the, uh, to the docks um, and to the steel works. But it was a wonderful place, Joe, to live. Mm. You, know, the, the, you know, everybody was together. It was such a close community, close-knit community. And I learned and, and trusted, um, you know, people. I learned how to trust people. Um, because those people would look after you if mum never had, you know, we, we were a big family, but we weren't the only big family in town. There was most of, you know, you go down most of the streets down Pell and you'd have, you know, eight, nine children. It was that yeah. period, you know, there, there's a lot of immigration there. Obviously, my grandfather, I'm, you know, second generation immigrant. You know, there was loads of Irish people there. There was loads of Italians, um, you know, West Indians came um, late on in the 60s. So it was, it was, you know, there was a mix of everything down there, Joe. But the community was absolutely fabulous. And if you were, if you were struggling a little bit, you know, like I, I was going to say, mum, if mum ran out of milk, you know, she could knock next door and get a bottle, lend a bottle of milk off the, the neighbours, and the neighbours would know mum would give that bottle of milk back when she had the opportunity and chance. Mm. And it, it, it was sort of like it was that that tight community that um, I was very, very, very fortunate to be brought up into. It's um, amazing as you're talking there to compare that world to the affluence of the Premier League world that you found yourself in and yeah. to compare the two. Those formative years, you know, at times going short and your mum maybe knocking next door and vice versa. How do you think that shaped your attitude to money when suddenly it was all around you? Were you always kind of saving for a rainy day or were you, you know, easy come, easy go? How do you uh, think that shaped yeah, you? Yeah, we, we, I've... I've Joe Fortune, I've never been in debt in the bank. I've never, you know, again, it's just the, the basic, I think, principles that you were brought up with as a as a young boy and, and in a, a family. You know, we were always taught to respect people who respected you. And we were always taught to, you know, when I got married, you know, the one thing, you know, my father said is that, you know, you make sure that there's enough food on the table. You know, there's a, you know, enough enough water and soap that you can wash yourself with and, and keep yourself clean and Make sure you pay your bills, mm. and that and that was you know that, that you know that just basic things that people forget now, Joe, or people don't even talk about anymore. You know the world's moved on, you know society's moved on. Um, but having said that, Joe, like I said, if you give me what I've got today and say, would you would you change that now for your upbringing? I wouldn't at all. Yeah. You know, my, I, you know, I got uh, friends there. Um, that I've known from primary school who are still there or still communicate and talk to um, and keep in touch with. And, you know, it's uh, 
yeah, it, it, it was it was a wonderful a wonderful area to yeah. be brought up into. So you weren't driving into the Stoke training ground in a Ferrari, is what I'm getting at. <laughs> well, it's funny actually because you know I talked to Deb the other day. You know, I, I, I married my wife, and and I think her car was the first car that actually came down our road. But my dad had a push bike. Um, we never had a car. Right. Um, so, you know, if we travelled, we travelled on foot or we caught buses. And that, that was right through all my life. My father did never, ever, ever have a car. Mm. It strikes me with your um, playing career, you were unlikely to get offered a Premier League job. You were going to have to take a team up to get to the big time. And you did that with Stoke and did it in style and I think scored 80 goals in the championship on the way up. And at that yeah. stage, Stoke had been 23 years away from the top division, maybe crowds of 10, 11,000 when you first took over. And, and we're talking about, you know, a career here where, as I mentioned, Premier League mainstays, FA Cup final, Europa League. So it went incredibly well. I know I read you phoned Steve Koppel, who'd obviously had his experience with Reading, and Alex Ferguson on promotion. And Ferguson had a good bit of advice. I think he said, if, if anyone in the top six compliments you, you're doing something wrong. You're not going to win many games away from home. You need to make the Britannia a miserable place to go to. Um, that turned out to be <laughs> that turned out to be pretty damn good advice. You obviously bought into that a little he bit. He, he turned out not to be a bad manager, did he? <laughs> yeah. So, he knew what he was talking about, Joe. Um, and when you speak, you know, I, I, I've got great respect for Steve as well, Steve Koppel. Mm. You know, Steve had uh, and was a, a very, very um, basic person in lots of respects an intelligent man um but you know he was uh, he was a good man as well and you know he, he told me about the fact that you would lose you know four or five games on the bounce which you're not used to what your players are not used to having come up from the championship and winning the chat or, or being promoted out of the championship they got used to winning and he said you you know you have to get used to use losing and you have to manage yourself through the, that period mm. because the players need as much help as they possibly can and what they don't need. They don't need a manager with his uh, his face around his backside all the time, walking around the place. You've got to manage yourself and you've got to be positive with them. Um, you know, although it'll hurt you, you have to be positive and look positive to everybody around you because you're the one really, you know, with a flag, you're leading the way, you're leading the charge. And, um, you know, again, you know, those little... Joe, those little bits of advice that you pick up along the way. Um, you know, if if you're intelligent enough um, to take things on board, um, you know, to wash away all the nonsense and take the important things on board, then, yeah, I think you uh, you grasp it pretty soon. And you, it happens, and it happened exactly the way the two lads said it would. Mm. Um, and luckily, you know, I was clever enough to take notice of the two of them. Yeah, you sure did, Tony. So things like narrowing the pitch, letting the grass grow. I think Arsene Wenger might have written a complaint to the FA about the length, <laughs> the length of the grass at the Britannia. Disgrace. Um, geez, you know, even I remember we do uh, commentaries, Premier League commentaries here in the station, and I remember where we, 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 you guys came up and like we had to get like thicker pop shields because the wind at the bloody Britannia. I mean, it was like <laughs> into the microphone the whole time. So even for us, it wasn't that pleasant to go to at times. Uh, and it just worked. The crowd bought into it. So all these kind of things, you were like the great disruptors and uh, you embraced it, it's, it seems, as a team. We're, we're not making it easy for this crowd coming. We're not making it easy for Arsenal. Well, I d you know, the, 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 the bottom line is, Joe, we, we'd go to, uh, to play Arsenal away from home. The pitch would be the biggest pitch in the league. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd have the shortest grass. Mm. They'd water the pitch before the game. And why did they do that? Because it suited them, because they had the best players in the league. Mm. So why shouldn't we do exactly the same at our place? 
to have an advantage that suits us. Like, you know, I just, you know, the, the problem you've got is that, uh, you know, the, the, the perception always falls on one side. Mm. But really and truthfully, we're just doing what they were doing. They were keeping it and making it as comfortable as they possibly could for the players they had. Mm. And, we, you know, you've got to remember one of their players most probably cost, you know, as much as all our players put together. Three of their players' wages would have paid for our whole salary, including the kids and the, um, you know, the, the 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 people in the canteen and around the training ground and everything else. Mm. So you know, you're competing. You're not really competing at the same level, and you've got to get results. And as I've said, you know, the 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 basis that I've always worked on, and you know, sometimes it upsets people. And hey, who doesn't upset people at times? Um, you know, is the fact that I, I would try and get the results any which way um, within the rules um, for my football club. Mm. And did you ever get a sense that you were getting under the skin of the big boys? Oh, Arsenal, yeah, definitely. I think, you know, I bump into support Arsenal supporters now and they'll always say, Tom, we just hated going to the Britannia. Mm. Just hated it. Um, but it was, it, you know, it, it, I think, Joe, the other thing is as well, and and again we go perception we had that first year first and second year where we were a very very direct in in lots of ways rory obviously rory broke the game up for us with the throw-ins mm. but we had some good players and we got better every year joe mm. and and you don't go to the last stages of europe you don't go to a cup final you don't finish comfortably every year in the premiership if you've got a, yeah, a bunch of players who can't play and you know when you look at pennant you look at Etherington, Crouchy, John Walters, you know, people of that ilk. Yes. You know, good forward players, you know, players who were, um, you know, who, who played for their countries, represented their countries and done exceptionally well for their countries. Um, yeah, we had a very, very, very solid backbone to the team. But we also had some good players, some very, very good players. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, a quote from Luis Felipe Scolari. I have never seen anything like this in my life. Now, he's seen a fair few things <laughs> in his life. So what Luis Philippe Scolari was talking about, and you mentioned him there, Rory Delap's throw-ins. Uh, <laughs> so look, on this side of the pond, we took a certain joy in watching, you know, Walters and Glenn Whelan and absolutely yes. Rory Delap yeah. doing his thing. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm right to say you signed him without even knowing this guy could throw a ball like that. Well, no, no, I don't think anybody did. I, you know, I spoke to Harry. Harry had him at Southampton, and Harry said... Tony, if I knew he could throw a ball like that, I'd never sold him. <laughs> um, you know, it, 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 they, they were having a competition one day on the training ground. I think it was pre-season, and they were try they they were trying to throw the ball. It, it, you know, I think they were having most probably knowing the lads at that time. We had a great group of players there. Yeah. They're most probably having a little competition who could throw it, you know, further than near post or whatever. And he picked the ball up and threw it. And I didn't see the first one. And Kempy, David Kemp was my assistant came over to me and just said, Tone, have you seen how, how Rory throws this ball? <laughs> and I've gone now, and I've walked over to him, and I can remember they're, they're at the top end of the training ground, and Rory's just, he's not just throwing it, he's, he's, he's pinging it in there. <laughs> um, and it's as flat as a pancake. It was just, uh, I just pulled him, I said, Rory, where have you been hiding that all your life? <laughs> and from that moment onwards, you know, we, we sat down, he said, yeah, it'd be a great, great opportunity great chance to get balls into the box, great opportunity to, to put teams under pressure. Um, and that's what we did. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, poor old Rory's played over 500 games in the, in the you know, the, in the top flight, I think. You know, he'll just be remembered for that long throw. I know, for the I fact know, I know. That, You know, you play 500 games, you're a good player. Yeah. You I know, you, you, you're not just one dimensional and, <laughs> like I say, um, you know, Rory will always be uh, be remembered for just that, well, that was, long throw. There was one season where a quarter of your 38 goals came from throw-ins. So, I mean, there was obviously great intelligence and they were choreographed and you worked in them as well. I, oh, you, no, we, you, we, you knew it was getting under people's skin when um, there yeah, was... The, we, the, we, the, we, we, didn't, we didn't just throw the ball in. Yeah. You know, we didn't just throw the ball in. You know, we, off set plays, a lot of set plays, we we would be very, very diligent in the work that we did. I think if you speak to the players now, um, they'd all moan and groan about the amount of time that they spent mm. off on doing set plays and working on set plays. Because in the early, like I say, the early years in the Premiership, we needed to find ways. We weren't gifted enough to open the top teams up, um, even at home. Mm. 
So mm. we had to find ways to to score goals. Yeah. And like I say, set plays was one of the one of one of the, the big things. I was just gonna say that you knew it was working when there was the famous moment where Boaz Mayel of Hull uh, scrambled to stop the ball going out for a, a throw so we could kick it out for a corner. That's when you knew teams. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, like, again, I'll, I'll talk about Harry. Harry said to me, you know, they'd turn up a top with Tottenham. And Harry said, I used to say to the lads, you know, kick it out for a corner. <laughs> stop and kick it out for a throw in. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it, it was, it was a great, great weapon. And um, Rory was one of the, the, the bedrock mm. people. Who we built the football club around, you know, not not just a um, a good player mm. um, and a good player with that wonderful long throw, but what a what a lovely lad as well and character. It's just a fabulous, fabulous boy. Yeah. Can I ask you about Glenn Whelan? And tell me if I'm right or wrong here. My sense of Whelan's career was that quite often Stoke would go and sign a midfielder in the summer in the anticipation of that midfielder maybe taking Glenn Whelan's place or certainly playing more. And one after one. Whelan kept yeah. seeing them off. Is that a fair? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, and and that's why I've got the greatest respect for Glenn. Um, every challenge you put in front of him, he would step up again. Um, and we brought some good midfield players in. Um, and I don't know through preseason at the beginning of the the season, Glenn would uh, Glenn would just step step up. And irrespective of what I'd spent on that midfield player, I always picked what I think are the best players for the team and Glenn Glenn would always prove to be the best player for that uh, for that position what we wanted and like I say as an individual uh, and as a person he can be a bit spiky at times with his teammates and with everybody else um, but uh, you know I have tr as a person um, and as a manager uh, having worked with players um, the fellow's got the great again the greatest respect for me for you know, just proving every not not a great favourite with the supporters, not a great favourite with the people or the public, but his teammates loved to, to play with Glenn mm. because he did all the yeah he did all the donkey work, Joe. And he was tidy enough on the ball; he'd keep the ball, um, and a very very intelligent player as well. Right? Yeah. No, I think we underrated him here as well in Ireland for a long time. I, yeah. I, I heard yeah. a story you told as well. I guess this kind of. You know, if, if he's kind of a, a cultural architect in some ways or, or sets a tone, you were saying there was a um, young player, I don't know who it was, and Glenn Whelan passed the ball to him, wasn't the best pass, and, you know, in front of the crowd, young player does that thing you should never do, which is, you know, shakes the head or yeah. throws the arm up. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Glenn let him know pretty quickly that's not how Stoke was going to operate. Well, it was a training session, actually, and it right. was uh, Brett Shea who, who played for America, and we signed Brett. Um, and unfortunately, he'd come over. He, you know, he did long, flowing blonde hair. But he was a nice lad, Brett. I think, you know, you look at him initially and you think he's a bit of a Charlie, but he was a nice lad. And um, Glenn hits this crossfield pass that went out to play, and Brett just stuck his hand up. I turned around to, we were doing 11 of the 11, I was coaching something. By the time I turned back, Glenn had, yeah, let's just say, shook him up a bit. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, Brett never, ever involved in any of that nonsense from that point but Joe that was the club that was the the, mm. the team the club the club was as I've said I've, I was brought up in a community in a family a very very family orientated community where everybody helped everybody else and everybody was as important as everybody else and I've always tried to build football clubs like that and you know if you spend enough time there um, you know the four years I had at Priestville that that team that I left was was absolutely fantastic, wonderful players, and they all worked so hard for one another and gave everything for one another. Mm. You know, you talk about side by side, they were, and at Stoke, uh, again over that period of time, everybody was side by side. You know, if 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 one person was in trouble, you know, there'd be five or six looking after him. There wouldn't be one standing up for him. There'd be five or six looking after him, and they they would. You know they would, uh, and um, they proved that the com you know that that community spirit was transformed into a football club, and into an area because we, we you know we we had unbelievable support. The Britannia Stadium was you know those first three years, four years, they're just rocking, mm. absolutely rocking. Um, yeah, everybody bought into what we were trying to do. Did you feel the expectations of the crowd change then? Because the perception would be, I mean, you kept delivering in a sense. I mean, 
Premier League stability and obviously FA Cup final bonus thrown in, Europa League thrown in. Could you feel that, you know, it's, I asked that because you say the first three, yes. four, three, four years there, that, that suggests maybe there was a bit of a change, it wasn't quite, quite bouncing. Was there more of a crossing our arms and what's next for us kind of thing? I, th I think, as, a, as a, a, again, we talk about society. I think society has moved on, Joe, and, and you know, in, in the times that we could walk up to a telly and, and turn it on and then walk up to the telly to turn the, the, the station over, have gone. You've got, you know, digital things that it just change, change and change. And I think there's been a sea change in management in this country as well. I, I think the time, you know, the times that people say, well, managers now can have a set time and given a set period to build a football club. Unless you're very, very fortunate, I mean very, very fortunate, unless you're winning games, and even when you do win games, and you overachieve and you overachieve, you know, the supporters still want more, mm. the public still want more, people still want more. And I, I understand that completely, and um, I understand the, the, the fact that there'll always be people out there, never mind what you give them, what you give them, they'll always want that little bit more, Joe. And supporters are no different. Mm. Um, and uh, like I say, the the the, the reaction um, of the, the first couple of years at Britannia, you know, I you know, I can remember the first win against Villa. Um, you, you know, the the noise. Um, you know, I think it was a long throw. Mama scored up on the back post. Um, Matt O'Neill was manager at Villa, I think, at the time, and they had a really good team. I'm not sure if they finished close to being in the top four that year. Yeah, I think there were um, six but, that but year, the whole yeah. yeah the whole stadium Joe just erupted mm. and it went on you know we played Man City with 10 men uh, James Beatty scored a goal just before half time and I can remember coming in afterwards and people saying well it's an extraordinary result to win 1-0 against Man City da, 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 da. you know with just 10 men and I said no I won 10 men you know, it's 30,000 Stoke supporters out there mm. against you know I felt sorry for the Man City players and they did. They, you know, they they cheered every pass, every tackle, every challenge, every time Man City had a shot, it was blocked or whatever. You know, the the, the, the whole place went up. It wasn't just one area or one bit. We, you know, we'd really built up, Joe, uh, uh, an unbelievable um, atmosphere there mm -hmm. and a togetherness that was, uh, yeah, very very unique. Very unique. We're chatting here with uh, Tony Pulis. If you're just uh, tuning in, this is our football special. With thanks to Paddy Power for information on responsible gambling, visit gamblingcare.ie. A few messages coming in. Uh, Jim says, uh, lads, could Messi have done it on a cold, windy night at Stoke? That's the big question. Well, indeed. I mean, that was the ultimate compliment. I think Messi would have been okay at Stoke all the same, Tony. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Messi. <laughs> I think you, you, could play, you could play Messi over the, over the pack tomorrow. And uh, it could be playing on stones, a stony pitch. The fellow's a, a genius, absolute genius. Yeah, blimey. If he'd have turned up in, at Stoke, even with the wind, even with the, the rain and, and it being midwinter, nah, nah. He, he, he would have been what he is, one of the greatest players we've ever seen. Did you depart then, Stoke, on good terms, bad terms? I know you're still very, very fond of Peter Coates. Um, uh, how, how, did, it, how did that finish? It, it was the right yeah it was the right time okay. it, was, it was done properly um i met peter and john in the offices at pet 365 um and it was amicable okay. and to this day you know i still keep in touch with uh, with them um they're they're wonderful people you know that peter was uh, was a a fabulous chairman to work under he was brilliant for me joe because I, you know i can i can if i feel as though things um, have turned and people are doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing, then I do get very, very irate and uptight. And, and uh, you know, most managers are, um, that you speak to, irrespective of who they are, can be a little bit insecure at times. Mm. But Peter was brilliant. P Peter treated me and managed me like no other uh, person I've ever, I've ever had above me. Um, he knew my strengths, he knew my weaknesses. And, um, yeah, it was a great great time great period and I have the, the utmost respect for him because I saw you say you are uh, determined to the point at times of obsessive where you could be irritable is what you said to put it nicely and you said P Peter managed <laughs> yeah, it very, very, very well in that way so you, you took some managing from his end did you I mean did you want uh, you were you just always looking around and unhappy with this and want things perfect or what did Peter do to calm you down at times I, I, I always I always wanted to make sure I was it, it, we'd you know, we had taken him into the Premier League. 
it wasn't just me it was the football club yeah. and the people involved the players coaching staff um you know peter the directors the, the coach family who've been fabulous support uh been fabulous support to, to stoke city um and to the community there um and i i felt a personal responsibility to keep them there i felt the personal responsibility to try and improve it year after year after year so if i seen things going on that i didn't think was right or what or people were becoming sloppy or people were doing stuff um or you know people were perceived to be doing stuff that they they weren't really doing then i i would i you know i'd be very forthright in my views and my opinions mm. um and i think what what peter was great at peter could read me um and we'd go out he'd take me out for a dinner he'd take me out for dinner on a thursday night usually on a thursday night with deirdre and malcolm his driver and we'd sit there and you know after a couple of glasses of wine he'd you know he'd talk about he'd bring it up but he'd always bring it up um when he had me you know when he had me he, he, we talk history which is a, a topic that i really really enjoy and peter's well-read person and he we talk about something that some event or some you know i don't know some happening with world war one two or the napoleonic wars or whatever we go into something but he'd get me nice and comfortable nice and relaxed and have a couple of glasses of wine mm. and then he'd say listen on that point mm. I think you're a little bit out of order there or listen you know that's yeah i'll take your point and i've spoken to people i th- I've, we'll make sure that doesn't happen again so he was he was fabulous you know he was um yeah just the way he, he managed me and the way he handled me and i think i think peter would have had great experience he'd worked with lou mccary joe jordan i know he had chris kamara and Pete. so we'd had real you know he'd had some sort of strong characters there as well mm. before you know he had gary there gary Megson was there as well so you know he had some strong characters and some strong people so we'd had the experience of working with these people and um yeah he, he could <laughs> he, he could work me joe and, and he could ha- definitely work me and have you mellowed yeah I, th- I think i've mellowed over over a period of time i also think that i've changed over a time as well i think that that first setting with with me at at priestfield and that would have gone on well into maybe even when we got into uh got promoted out of the championship but as time changed and with the quality of players that you work with and the way life has turned around and you know the 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 you know the health and safety and all this stuff now this you know you you have to be careful what you say and what you do you know you, you do you you understand and you recognize you become more educated as you go along um and under, you know understand that there's a, it's a different world now to what we lived in um 20 30 years ago when i started well longer than that joe longer than that you know uh, so, so tactically things are very interesting right now you didn't happen to watch monday night football this week did you where jamie carragher was doing a piece on how uh, tuchel's center backs are roving up into midfield and pressing did you catch that by any chance um, yeah, I've listen. I, I I have my own. I, I you know, people talked. You know, I, I've seen people fall over backwards with um, with people playing with no centre forwards. Um, you know, with, with I, you know, Pep has played with no centre forwards. He's played this and he's done that. Yeah. Oh, in nineteen, I think 76, 75, 76, something like that. I went to a coaching seminar at Bath University, and Malcolm Allison took Bristol Rovers under 18s um as one team and bristol city's under 18s as another team and he put a session on exactly the same with no sent forwards nice. and the way he did that Mal- this is malcolm allison this is in the 70s and the way he did it is exactly the way that, that the lads are doing it today and it was just you know extraordinary i'm, I'm looking at you can imagine in 76 where you know england we were still playing four four two or whatever yeah get the ball forward back it up and this uh, the way he did it was just absolutely unbelievable. It was, it was frightening, um, and and you know that there's, I've wa- I've wa- watched, learned, and listened to a lot of great coaches in my time. Mm. I think the coaches that we've got in now, uh, most probably the you know we've had the best coaches in the world in England, apart from maybe uh, the lad who was at Juventus won all those titles, mm. um, and the lad at uh, Atletico Madrid, they're most probably the two biggest names that we've missed out on. Um, 
they've been I think that they've, they've brought they've certainly brought something different to the game in England yes. they've certainly improved it they've brought the levels up um, I think they've brought the levels up in lots of ways but I also think <laughs> there's some wonderful coaches in England and there's coaches who do and uh, uh, can do jobs at these these lads that we're talking about I have no no you know I have great respect for Pep um, and, uh, you know he'd become a very good friend over a period of times but he, I don't think Pep could do what uh, what Deutsche's done at Burnley hmm. I don't think Tuchel can do what Deutsche's done at Burnley I don't think there's 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 many co- these coaches are used to working with the top players with the best players um, and you know what Sean has done at uh, Burnley and other managers in, in, in respect now who are managing below the sandlot who yeah. get results Chris Wilder at Sheffield United last year Obviously, it's not happened this year for him, but last year, you know, the results that these lads get and they're working below the sand line. Mm. It takes a lot, a lot of coaching, a lot of hard work and a lot of preparation to get results. You, what you're doing, Joe, you are playing against teams every week who've got better players than you, so-called, on paper. The budgets are bigger. They've got better facilities. They've got better organisation behind the scenes, better recruitment. They've got, they spend an absolute fortune on what they do. Mm. And you're behind them. But every Saturday, you've got to turn up and try and get results and try and win football matches. And the people who do it at the smaller clubs on a regular basis, you know, they, they should be admired more in this country than what they are. Yeah, I take the point. The reason I asked you about the two goal centre halves the other night is it just jumped out to me, and I, I knew I'd be talking to you, and I may have this wrong, so I'm kind of curious to get your sense of, of tactics and how they've changed. I would have had Stoke maybe as a more compact team that bit deeper you certainly would have seen centre halves covering each other and not roving off following men so if you were back in the Premier League anytime soon would your approach change then or would it be very much a Stoke um, approach if I was managing Chelsea if I was managing Man City of course it'd change well even but even kind of a a (laughs) lower that's the point yeah no no but even making right at the beginning even a lower even a lower table team because I don't see for instance the great disruptor anymore like Big Sam and West Brom have gone down and I would have had you down as a disruptor and I don't mean that in a pejorative way yes but you watch teams now right down even to League One and you've got like the centre half splitting and taking the ball from the keeper you know it's all more homogenised so would you almost have to Go in, you know, go go that way, or could you still disrupt almost in the way you did with Stoke? I, I you know, I, we 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 I played with Johnny Evans at um, West Bromwich Albion. Yeah, and um, you know, Johnny was a great footballer, great on the ball. You, you'd let Johnny have the ball anyway on the pitch. You know, mm. Johnny could play in midfield, he could play centre half, play full back, he could play centre forward. I think. So if you've got players like that, Joe, who are comfortable with the ball, um, and not going to cost you, um, then yeah, you know, why not? Um, but if you haven't, if you've got if you've got stoppers, if you've got Shawcross and Ooth and people who were uh, you know their their strengths are defending, not not dealing with the football and especially under pressure, mm. then you wouldn't put him in. I wouldn't put him in that position. Yeah, Joe. It's common you know, sense. As, common I, as sense, I said, really. you know, I, I, yeah, it's common sense. I went from Stoke, where we had a Crouch or a Kenwin Jones or whatever, so we had a target man we'd play off. So we'd always be looking to play off them and get setups to go wide. And then I went to Palace with uh, Palassi and Punch and White and Cameron Jerome up front, who was a runner. So you got three runners. It was completely, we had to play completely different at Palace than what we did at Stoke. Mm. And then when I went to West Brom, we had midfield players as our best wide players. So instead of playing, and, and we had a lad called Bobby Brown, who they'd signed from um, abroad somewhere. Um, and, um, you know, the, uh, do, 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 oh, what's his name? Sido Berrino. Hmm. So Sido, you know, Sido was a young lad, 20 years of age, playing as a 10. So we we completely played different there. We played the wide players inside the pitch. Um, and we played Sido and Brownie a little bit deeper. So we'd get smaller passes. We had good footballers, you know, Brunty, Morrison, people like that really really good footballers so you could put you could play through the pitch to get where you eventually want to get mm. and that's in dangerous areas where you can cross balls to get people yeah. scoring off crosses or you know uh, you know people shooting from around the area or just inside the area so if you if you have a look you know if you're, if you're sensible enough and you understand your tactics in football mm. you have a look at the teams that you t- you, that managers take over and then, uh, you know, uh, like I say, that in the clubs I'm talking about, I'm going into football clubs 
at Palace and West Brom where you, and you have to get results almost immediately. You've got no time, no time whatsoever, um, you know, to say, well, I'll give it 10 games or whatever and, and, and then hopefully just change it next season. You have to do what you, you've got to do with the players you've got. Yeah. And, you know, there's no way I could have played the way Stoke played with, with Bobby Brown up front and Sido. Sido couldn't head, you know... The, Couldn't have a bus queue, never mind a a blinking football. So, you know, you you, you just wouldn't... You wouldn't do it. It wouldn't have... Yeah, it was completely different, Joe. And and that's where, you know, all that coaching over the years, all that work that I've seen other people do and and what what you can do, I think, with different individuals is based on their ability. Yes, well, Um, that that makes makes sense. Um, I was talking to... Yeah, a f- I, 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 get, I get a little bit frustrated at times that, you know, and I'm, t- I'm talking about even the, the, the lad at Southampton who's done a, a good job there at times, a, a, has done a wonderful job there. You know, sometimes he gets a little bit of stick. But again, you know, Southampton are not one of the, the bigger teams. He is mm. a manager that's come, come in from abroad. You know, the lad at, the, the, at Barnsley, you know, who's coming at Barnsley and, and played a way that suits his players. It, it's not, you know, it's the, the most direct I've seen since Wimbledon mm. but he's done fun. they're in the playoffs uh, and he's getting some praise which he deserves but he certainly ain't playing out from the back no true because he hasn't got the players to do it I was talking to a former player of yours and he was um, he was singing your praises and I was saying anything any kind of memories and he said two things he said brilliant man manager <laughs> brilliant man manager as in you know would be in the canteen and, and sitting with the 16th 17th 18th men, keeping their morale up, including them. And then he also said, ask him about pre-season. And he had a, a, a picture of a very pained expression. So <laughs> Drill Sergeant Pulis obviously was no fun pre-season. So they were the two. Yeah, no, pre-season was always, um, I'd, I'd take him to Austria. And um, yeah, we'd, we'd have a bit of fun for 10 days. Um, but they all bought into it. it you know, it, 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 you look at it on paper, you look and when you get there, you tell the players, what you're going to do, and they're all looking at you through, thinking, well, what, you know, what, what's this man doing? Um, but, you know, everybody who's done, you know, I spoke to um, an ex-player of mine the other week. He's got a, it's amazing. His, his son is, is just breaking into professional football, and he, he wanted a little bit of advice for his son. And we got talking about stuff, and, and one of the things he, bring, he brought up was the preseason, and just said, it's unbelievable. It's just, you know, at the time, Gaffer, it was, you know, it's just so hard. But then, when you look back, it was just brilliant. It, it, you know, the, the 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 togetherness that it brought the group, and how fit we were. I've never been fitter in my life. Hmm. So you know, it, it was it was Joe. It's tough, um, but it's it's organised, well planned out, hmm. um, and it's done with a purpose. And that 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 was the big thing. You know, people say, "Oh, he's running up. He shouldn't be running up hills." You know, I've never seen anybody. This, the, the, our hills are really steep. I've never, we've never had a, a pulled muscle run up the hill. We never let them run down the hills. We always got golf carts. They jump in the golf carts. They come down the hills, so they wouldn't pull any muscles coming down the hills, or they wouldn't do any damage coming down. And that, you know, we do strength and conditioning in the afternoon um, in a massive gymnasium. We play a bit of head tennis and this, that, and the other. And in the evenings, we'd be on the grass. So you'd have three sessions a day for, for 10 days um, and at altitude. And it, it, it honestly, it really helped. And then we'd go to America and I'd work in very, very warm, um, humid conditions for, for then, again, another 10 days. Bring them back, we play a few games, we'd start the season. Mm. So it was all planned out for, for a reason. And, the, and the, my, my, my big thing for pre-season is to get the players through fit, and ready to go mm. not worry about results I never worried about results in pre-season um, I just worried about their fitness getting them through mm. fit no injuries no problems get every if we start with 25 let's finish with 25 and make sure they're fit yeah uh, I do want to ask you about the history because I know I, I did read in advance that you like that I, there's a lot of people texting in saying they're really enjoying hearing from you hope to see you back in the game again uh, very soon and there's a bunch of them and I know there's no point asking you this because I've watched other interviews you've done there's a bunch of them saying ask him about the James Beatty incident in the dressing room because uh, that image once you hear about that story I think it's hard to forget for people <laughs> <laughs> no I think, I think I think what happens in the dressing room happens in the dressing room and you know James as I've said before you know James 
I, I can't remember him, but what do you get? 12 goals from Christmas on for us. Mm. Or, you know, it, it, he was... Him and Matt, Matty Etherington, that, that second year, uh, we signed James and Matty. Those two kept us up, without a question of a doubt. And I'm, I'm a great team man. Mm. But those two individuals, Etherington, was just absolutely fan- fantastic on the left-hand side for us. Real quality, real pace. Um, Matty was a top player. Uh, you, he, he, was, he, was, he, he was always your favourite. You, you played oh, favourites yeah, yeah, with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was... Um, Never got given out boy, to. Really, he was my boy, <laughs> and uh, and and um, you know, I, I just he, he had tremendous talent. Um, he had his issues off the pitch, and I think that's most probably why I warmed to him so much as well. Mm. Um, but he, he was, you know, like I say, as a player, I can rem- I can remember him doing stuff, you know, just extraordinary stuff, you know, outstanding ability. And James came, and I I got to be honest, Joe, you know, he. he Every time we got across into the box, James seemed to score. If he mm. wasn't scoring, he looked as though he, he was going to score. So you know, for all you know, that one incident, you know, Beatty beat, played a big part at Stoke. Yeah, and that you know, second year. you know, so that one incident, and look, it's the it frack and the dressing room, and people find it hilarious because you're you're both in the nip effectively because it's it showers and these things are funny to us on the outside, but they're day to day in football. On a more uh, serious note. Next day or, or a couple of days after that does, that, does something like that linger or do you just kind of put that behind you straight away? Is something like that, that a big deal? Well, I think there's different... In, I, I think there's different um, instances instance, or, 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 or happenings, let's put it this way, mm. um, that you respond differently with. I think, I think there's, there's, you know, stuff that goes on that you can wash away. There's other stuff that you... You feel as though you know that might come back and bite you. It might mm. come back and bite the club. Mm. Might come back and bite the players. It might affect the dressing room. If anything ever I ever thought would affect the dressing room, um, in respect of um, you know them being the most important people, then I would deal with it. If I felt that it was something you know that that you know that we could get over and and that we could move on, then there, there was never a problem with me. I'd always put the club. I don't think I've ever been in a position where I haven't done anything where I think, you know, the club got to come first and my, you know, my players have got to come first and the team's got to come first. And I've been um, one of those people, Joe, that if I don't think, if I don't think things are are being done properly, um, whether it's a chairman or whether it's a player, whether it's a coach working for me or whatever, then, um, you know, I won't have it, Joe. I just don't have it. It's it's just not part of me. Yeah. On the... um history thing you mentioned you're a fan of history and you jo- enjoy your reading so I mean you would have left school then at 15 and, and embarked on this uh, journey uh, would you would you like to have gone to university is that a regret you're obviously you know if you're drawn to reading history no, and following Joe, history you've Joe, got a, you've got a brain no Joe uh, you know I've been the luckiest man alive you know I've, I've come from a you know a, a very very you know big family um, my dad was a steel worker. Mum never went to work. She was in the kitchen all the time looking after the children. Um, and I've come out and had the life I've had. Mm. I've been the luckiest person alive. You know, there's nobody, you know, it, you take some flack in this job, you take some stick in this job, and people criticize you and people have a go and say this and that. Uh, you know, I've been the luckiest person alive. Mm. You know, I've got, I've got some, you know, great experiences um, as a player, as a coach, as a manager. You know things that I, I could never have dreamed of. You know I've done loads of stuff as well for charity. You know we've we've walked Kilimanjaro. I've cycled from John O'Groats to Land's End. We've rode from Tower Bridge to the Eiffel Tower. Um, I've rode. I've cycled from uh, Paris to La Havre. Rode across the Channel, then walked from Brighton to London. You know I've done so many things mm. in my life. Joe, that I look back on and, and, you know, there's stories behind all of it. All the clubs I've been at, what is it, 10, 11 clubs I've been at, there's stories out of every club. You know, the Sheffield Wednesday one didn't last long. Mm. Uh, I've spoke to a friend there today and, and you know, there was lovely, they were, in the short period I was there, there's still lovely people I met. There's still, you know, there, there's still memories there for me um, and good memories. So, you know, it's, yeah, I've, I've, Joe, I've just been so fortunate. Yeah, yeah. No, I definitely, I've won the lottery. I, I know you have. I definitely wouldn't um, ask you, would you swap it for university? But obviously there was a, a thirst for knowledge there or something there. So when did all that start and why history, do you think? 
So I, I, I always looked at, um, I, I was fascinated with, with leaders who uh, um, had come from nowhere. Right. Um, you know, Napoleon, obviously born in Corsica, although it was a rich family in Corsica. You know, a little boy then sent to France. And how, how, the, how did he come, become one of the, you know, the, 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 one of the greatest generals in European history? You know, whichever way you look at it, whether it's good or bad, or, you know, you might be a negative on Napoleon, you might be a positive with him. But how did he get to that point? You know, and different people like that, people who have worked their, th- worked their way through, you know, Churchill was, was part of the establishment and he was in and out and in and out and in and out and in and out. And he was in and out and in and out because of the establishment. And he was a great wartime leader. He was the ma- a man for our time then. And, that, and that, that was, and he was a great orator and this, that and the other. But, you know, he, he didn't float my boat because he was part of the establishment. It yeah. was, uh, you know, it's, it's people who have had to work their way up, Joe, and, and people who have been successful from, from coming from, from nowhere. Right. You know, they're, they're the people that, that interest me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you don't have to be Freud, Tony, to probably see why you can relate to them, I suppose. Is that the interest? Um, I, I suppose, yeah. And, and the, other, the, the other thing that I like, I like, reading about is is their journeys as well you know what you know was it just from you know they they, they went from the bottom to the top straight away or did they mm. you know why did they then fall you know what what was why did they stumble you know if they came back what brought them back and you know that yeah it's just i just like it and um you know like i say world war one history that you know the turn where really you know the first time that really heavy equipment really determined battles um and before before that i think you know the napoleonic years i mean how many you know soldiers were killed man to man fighting joe mm. you know it's just extraordinary that these people would isn't, um, isn't, would follow yeah follow a leader isn't it a shocking waste of all that so, life over you know decisions made at oh, the top with such know, little that, regard uh, joe what 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 amazes me as well is is the way they live you know, I've I've read a book, The Dorset Soldier. I, I don't, you know, it's out there somewhere right. um, about a lad who enrolls, in, in, and I think I think he eventually ends up in one of Wellington's um, regiments. Um, but the way they live, Joe, you know, it, it's just extraordinary. You know, they, they were so tough, yeah, so resilient. They're just a different breed to us. Um, you know, marching, marching for months and then fighting. You know, they, they, it's just extraordinary. Yes. That the amount of, um, you know, pain and, that they must have gone through, but never even, most probably never even thought about it, Joe. It's just a different world. Um, and, 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 and something that, you know, I sometimes look back on and think, oh, you look at what we've got now. Oh, listen, you, lo- you look lucky. at what those, those people went through. Would, um, yeah. I don't know how political you were, but during, and I could be off here, but my guess would be during the 80s and Thatcher's time that it wouldn't have been great for Newport or some <laughs> of the industries that you came from. Yeah. So what was that yeah. like as you're kind of making your way in football? It can't have been a great time for Newport. Do, do you have memories of that or did you feel polit- politically motivated at any stage? Well, I think Wales is still the only um, country in the UK has voted in a Labour government again. Um, I, you know, I, I, it's it's inbred in you, really. Mm. I've been very disappointed with with Labour. I've been very, very disappointed with the way it's been run over the past, what is it, 10, 12 years. Um, but, you know, you're brought up in that in that environment. You're brought up, you know, to... to you know, Thatcher was despised in South Wales. Mm. Um, and I mean despised um, for what she did. You know, she broke up communities, and I don't think she'll ever be forgiven there. And um, was that a horrific time for your wider family? I think it was an horrific time for people who lived, especially up the valleys, Joe. Um, there was a whole communities that were just destroyed mm. without any thought. Um, that was the worst thing, you know, shutting down. She had a point. Um, I'm not I'm not saying Scargill and, and the unions did um, did any good in... in, in you know the way they um, projected their ideas, um, and there should have been a middle ground found. But then you had one very, very stubborn woman who I believe just wanted to to prove to everybody that um, you know no one was bigger than than her and the power that she had. Um, but it was back. It was yeah, yeah. I look back and I think they were 
they were really really poor times you 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 know you live through them and you get on with life joe that's what you do mm. um but it's it's left a a real stain like i say especially up the valleys you know, you go up there and see the community still haven't recovered today right. from what uh, what was taken away from them. And will, will Wales ever go for independence? Is that coming? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure whether it's a good thing or bad thing. You know, I I, I think um, I'd rather be uh, us all be together. I suppose. Mm. In, in if you want my view, mm. I'd rather we're, we're stronger together. Mm. Um, and it's wonderful, you know, when you see the British Lions travel away and you see the support the, 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 with, you know, all the union supporters there um, and the spirit that's, that's generated and brought together mm. uh, is just remarkable. And I'd love to keep that, to be honest. Yeah. I don't know. What, what do you think? What's your views? Uh, I wouldn't know enough about Wales at all. I think the Scots are heading that way. British, yeah. British and Irish lines as well, Tony. British and Irish <laughs> lines, yeah. Um, but I'm, 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 you know, I, I, if if Wales are knocked out of a tournament, and you've got Ireland in, I want Ireland to win, or Scotland to win, or England to win. Yeah. You know, that's the way I am. Yeah. It's it's you know that that's I've always been that way. I've always been this country first. Um, and I say this country, I mean uh, the union. Yes. Um. So. The Sheffield Wednesday thing lasted about 10 games and that ended in uh, December. You're still fit, healthy, strong. Are you itching to get back in the game? Is there Are there years ahead, hopefully, of management for you? Are job offers coming? Are job offers not coming? What's the next couple of years looking like? Well, I've got seven grandchildren, Joe. I've got two <laughs> in, the, in the room next door to me that okay. we've been out playing um, crazy golf this morning with. Um, I've got, obviously, my son is in America with Miami. We've not been able to go over there for a year now. We've got two uh, two grandchildren there that we haven't seen for a year, which is, um, you know, killing Deb. Um, you know, she's desperate to get over and mm. see him. Mm. Um, but we've got five very close to us, so that that's been a, a real um, bonus for me. Um, I've done other stuff as well, Joe, um, which I've, um, you know, it's been really good. It's you know, it's taken my mind off. I think you've got to keep yourself. If, if you're occupied and you're doing stuff um, and you're engaged with other stuff, then, you know, that, that, that's, you know that, that keeps me going. If I was sat here twiddling my thumbs, I'd be an absolute nightmare. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm still okay. up. Yeah. Six o'clock in the morning, I still do my work in the gym. I've got a lovely garden, Joe. I'm getting better at gardening than I've ever been before. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm picking up little things here, what to do, what not to do. I've cleared away um, some stuff and got this little fountain going in the back of the garden, which we hadn't seen for a few years. So little things like that, Joe. Have uh, yeah, it's been nice. Mm. It's been um, it's been refreshing. And if the phone um, if the phone, phone rings, are you looking at the phone hoping it rings? Uh, I'll I, Joe. You can never say never in in football, um, but I have I have to say I have enjoyed this break. This has been a good break. Right. So maybe let's uh, enjoy it a bit longer and not rush back type thing. <laughs> well, we see. You, you know what football's like, Joe. I do. You'll be back in work in a week, is the thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have to get past them. <laughs> Um, listen, it's great to hear about uh, your, your youth and where you came from and, and how things went at Stoke. And uh, I'm sure we probably will see you back in a job again. You love it too much, I think, to stay away. But Tony Pulis, it's been really lovely having you on the show. All the best for the future. Thanks so much. Yeah, cheers, Joe. Thank you. Cheers. That was uh, Tony Pulis. On, off the ball.